Good morning and welcome to another special edition of our weekly Facebook Live FAQ session where we go over your most pressing immigration, entertainment, and tech related questions. My name is Chris Cubson and I'm the PR Communications Associate here at DLSEO Law Group. And you may, have, may or may not have noticed that the last couple of months we've been very busy here at the firm. On top of expanding the music services that we offer to our clients, you might have caught our own Michael Linowitz the past couple of weeks reviewing the various types of music licensing and how songwriters, producers, and musicians can benefit from them. Last week, our founding partner and CEO, Lorraine D'Alessio, served as the keynote speaker at Canadian Music Week. And there we were able to chat with a number of musicians, songwriters, and music industry executives on a wide variety of pressing topics and subjects that we're seeing in music in 2018. Uh, this week, we're honored to have attorney Paul Farberman answer some of your questions from the last couple of weeks. Uh, Paul attended York University and Osgood Hall Law School in Toronto and has represented countless recording artists, songwriters, producers, production companies, managers, and clients in the film, television, and radio industries. Some clients include legends such as Rush, Saga, Triumph, Tom Cochran and Red Rider, Jim Carrey, and the Second City Comedy Troupe. Paul has worked at a number of industry-leading companies and labels, including CBS Records Canada as VP of Business Affairs, then later as VP of Business Affairs for IRS Records in Los Angeles. Since then, he's worked for Universal Pictures, 20th Century Fox, and eventually joined Feeling Productions, where he worked closely in a managerial role for legendary music icon Celine Dion. Paul, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Great to be here. And when I hear all that, it sounds like I'm 85 years old <laughs> or couldn't keep a job. But, uh, a, but, yeah. a legend, though. You've, uh, you've seen it all. So um, let's start off with some great questions that we've been receiving on our Facebook and from uh, various people that we talked to at Canadian Music Week. So right off the bat, if you're an unsigned independent artist or musician, what are a few dependable ways that you can make money through your work? Well, the most obvious, of course, and, and what's become more important for artists than ever is live performing. Mm -hmm. uh, easier said than done because you have to have fans and a fan base and people are going to come out to see you perform. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to start off, of course, is um, trying to get, uh, using all your resources, connections, friends, etc., to maybe open up for other artists, even if you're... Uh, third or fourth act on a, on a show and even if you're early on uh, so many people did start like this it's, it's you you got to get out there as much as possible uh, you know swallow your pride and ego and get out there and perform wherever you can for however many people may be there it's if your music's good if you're if you're good people will spread the word mm -hmm. uh, so live performance is clearly um, the key you know, to, to, to get fans. Um, of course, when you're doing these opening, opening slots, you're probably not getting paid much, if anything, but it's a step towards building that. And of course, how do you get fans in this day and age? You know, all of the social media outlets that, that now are there are, but everyone's vying for that space. Mm -hmm. How do you get into that space? You use your resources, your ingenuity, your creativity to create um, noticeable things, good music. Mm -hmm you know people will find it and spread the word what's amazing is um and i have young daughters is and and so they are constantly you know we get in the car and they don't put the radio on they put where's your ox dad and put it and they're playing music and i go who's that and how do you know about that mm -hmm. and and they listen to such a wide variety of music um they're 14 and um it's all genres and it's yes they love the big hits artists but they listen to things that are almost unknown mm -hmm. and they through their friends and you know oh you know this and, and this is similar so it, it's obviously become an incredible tool that didn't exist uh, you know years ago and one has to just be as I say very creative and get out there and yeah. post things uh, get people's attention and, and if your music is good people will be drawn to it yeah and that, that actually leads us to our, our next question which um, you're kind of talking about like how accessible music is these days um, how have streaming platforms like Apple Music, Spotify, Pandora, or SoundCloud and YouTube shaped the industry, both from a listener standpoint and from a music creation standpoint? Well, what they've done is is somewhat um, made the you know Billboard charts and, and, and the historical charts uh, not as relevant in the old way because what's really become relevant is 
not so much your chart numbers on something like that, but for example, you know, on Spotify, Pandora, what your chart numbers on there, because that's what people are really tuning into. Mm -hmm. What what uh, people of any age that they're they're tuning in and listening, and, and so those have become, you know, so important. And, and you know what what's changed in in terms of um, the business side is record companies and I say this with respect to my friends at record companies and but they'll be the first to acknowledge and agree uh, with rare exceptions they're not developing young talent the way they used to it's not that they go into a club or hear a demo and go oh my god what an incredible artist you want to sign them we'll fund work with the material the producers and, and build them up and market them they, they don't have the luxury of, uh, of the time to, and, and money to spend developing artists so they when I'm talking about the major companies now, the Universals, the Sonys, the, the Warner Brothers of the world and their subsidiaries, they actually have young students, young people mm -hmm. working for them full time, in some cases, monitoring social media. Mm -hmm. And when they see something on the radar that's getting a lot of activity that's like independent, they go, what's this? They bring it to the attention of their, you know, and our guys, mm -hmm. they go it out. So it's becoming more of a, a science and an art almost in terms of what the major labels are signing. I'm not saying that exclusively that way. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's still examples where, uh, you know, a record label will find an incredible young talent uh, who's not necessarily having such activity be blown away and want to work with them. But that's become what was the norm more rare. And so it's um, uh, so important not just to attract the major record companies, but uh, all of these outlets that you've mentioned mm -hmm. um, are key to getting people's music out, out there uh, to their own audience and to other people's and get noticed and, and bills from there. Yeah, it, it's almost like a reactionary sort of thing now where um, before maybe like 10, 20 years ago, it's the sort of thing where you have labels, like you said, building up an artist, whereas like now it can almost be a reactionary sort of thing where if you're an independent artist and you're hitting these sort of uh, numbers or listening numbers that you're going to catch the ear of those who are at the labels. Right. So it's kind of an interesting sort of like change in the music industry, especially Absolutely. considering that uh, music streaming, I think it was just this last year that music streaming became the most preferred method of listening to music. Right. Um, passing, you know, typical download sales or uh, sure. stuff like that. So um, kind of tying back to um, licensing and some topics that our own Michael Linowitz has been discussing the last couple weeks, are there any factors that musicians and songwriters should consider when deciding which PRO to register with? Are there strengths to going for an ASCAP versus BMI, or is it sort of like an even playing field? I, I, from my point of view and, and working with a lot of writers uh, over the years, I would say it's a pretty even playing field. Mm -hmm. I, I always suggest to songwriters uh, who are not necessarily with one of the societies that they go and meet uh, with uh, you know each the representatives uh, of each society and the, the membership division and let them present their case and their story as why. I mean, if you go um, to CSAC or, or ASCAP or BMI, um, they they don't badmouth one another. Mm -hmm. they, they respect the other organization. They're not going to tell you, you know, bad things about them. They just will point out why they feel they, what the strengths are and the way they're built and the way mm -hmm. they work uh, may be different and, and more advantageous. At the end of the day, it, it, it's a very personal decision. You mm -hmm. may, you know, have a, go in, meet with the people there and feel a good, you know, relationship and spirit there. You might feel an affinity to some of the writers that they represent, that are, who you respect, mm -hmm. that are there. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, personal choice. You could ask, you know, 100 songwriters. You might have 50 saying they prefer one society over the other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a personal choice, and I really encourage people, and, and you know, to go see the membership people. And there are offices all across the country. Of course, in Canada, it's the wonderful people and my dear friends. That's so can. <laughs> if I am a songwriter and I and my work is getting heard and it's um, you know attracting a bit of attention, if I'm getting approached by uh, various publishing companies asking me to sign with them, what are what are the advantages to going with an established publishing company? 
Well, the advantages, are, there could be a number of advantages. Mm -hmm. Number one, if you're a songwriter and a recording artist, um, that publisher can be very, very helpful and instrumental in helping you get your recorded music out there, either through connecting you with record companies, major record companies, independent record company distributors, or, or whatever. They can be very helpful in getting your music out there um, from, you know, t uh, from the recording side. Mm -hmm. If you're not necessarily a recording artist, but simply a songwriter, obviously um, they're in tune. It's their job to be to know who's looking for what material, uh, what kind of material. Artists who don't write their own material, you know, what style, who's looking for it. They know they have the relationships with the people at the uh, at the movie studios for film, for TV, at advertising agencies to get your music synced into into you know film, TV, uh, commercials, etc. Um, you know, the key is obviously the bigger the publishing company, the more songwriters they have, how to, and why are they going to pay attention to you? Um, you have to find that person there who really you feel, you know, a good relationship with that is going to give you the, you know, time and attention you deserve and not get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's a really important to build that relationship, but they can be, um, a very helpful in so many ways. And... You shouldn't be afraid to think, oh my God, I'm, I'm giving away my publishing or I'm giving away 50% or 10%. Mm -hmm. Of course, you always got your writer's share. Mm -hmm. And though you may be giving up part of the publishing, and maybe it's just an administration deal, um, you know, they're going to, you're going to still get your fair share of income. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in some cases, depending on, you know, the strength of your material and where you are, they may pay you what might be a very critical advance. Mm -hmm. They might pay you some cash up front, which really can help you develop your career in all other areas. So um, there are a lot of pluses uh, if it's the right company and the right people at the company. Cool. Um, so kind of wrapping things up, and we uh, spoke about this a little bit with streaming platforms, but uh, are there any emerging trends that you're noticing that are poised to shape the industry uh, the most in the, year, the next couple of years? For my own work, I have to say, I haven't been, you know, that plugged into some, some of those things that are really newer right now happening, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the other thing I, w I would say in wrapping up, I would uh, encourage people, uh, writers, to get out there and attend things like just had Canada Music Week in Toronto that you mentioned. Uh, ASCAP had their own uh, big uh, seminar, a few days of, of seminars and speakers and, and, and panels here and, and other... Um, industry events uh it's gr now you know some of them cost a lot mm -hmm. but some of them you can attend even if you don't get to the seminars and don't pay the registration fee mm -hmm. go to the hotel where it is or go there hang around the lobby meet people you never know who or where you're going to meet at these things mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity to meet people to connect with people other writers publishers record labels producers people who you might just somehow hit it off with and could lead to something but you need to get out there and put in the FaceTime. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a great tip for, for songwriters out there. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, Paul. And thank you guys so much for joining us for another weekly edition of Facebook Live FAQ session here at DLSEO Law Group. If you have any follow-up questions for Paul or any other topics that you'd like us to discuss in the future weeks, uh, reach out through the DLSEO Law Group Facebook page or drop us a line or hit our email up anytime. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thanks, Chris.